I am here in the heart of America, broadcasting live and heard on freedomslips.com and being simulcast by wolfspiritradio.com and also heard at journeyswithrebecca.com. Good evening, everyone. This is your host, Rebecca Jernigan, and you are listening to Journeys with Rebecca. Good Friday evening to everyone. I invite everyone to log on to my website. That's journeyswithrebecca.com, and please check out the new website and features. Uh, lots of updates uh, took place today, uh, as they will be each and every day uh, for the next few weeks as we continue working on the new website. Uh, while you're there, please be sure to sign up for the newsletter. You can get to that right at the top right-hand side of each page on the site. Um, and while you're there, don't forget that the online uh, summit that took place on January 5th is now available for delayed stream. Fantastic, almost four hours long. Uh, packed and chocked full of information from all of the wonderful speakers. Uh, a very long Q&A session, very uh, profound questions were asked, so please do uh, be sure to participate. And as, an, as a note here, please remember that the radio stations, both Freedom Slips and Wolf Spirit Radio, are commercial free and listener supported. So please do use the site support button. You can find that at freedomslips.com. Uh, please donate to your favorite show. And use the donation button found at wolfspiritradio.com. Now, a couple more announcements before I get into the details of my great guests and topics for tonight. This is going to be so much fun. Um, the 20th is my Timeline Past Life Regression Workshop. Uh, there's three spots left uh, for these remarkable workshops. So please uh, make sure that you uh, hold your place by going in and uh, on the actual classes tab on journeyswithrebecca.com and reserve your space. I do these only once a month. Uh, they're limited to six people, so please do take advantage of that if you can. And Tarot the Intuitive Workshop uh, will be available in February. I'll be putting that up uh, sometime next week on the date for that. Please be sure to get your copy of the book prior to the workshop. It's going to be a very intensive uh, class designed to unlock your potentials uh, of all of your sensory perceptions that you are not currently perhaps using. Now, on to tonight's guest. This uh, uh, lady here is one of the most fantastic ladies I've run across in a very, very long time. Uh, her name is uh, Angel Rose O'Grady. The book that she has written called A Time of Change, The Akashic Guidance for Spiritual Transformation. Um, it is a guidance for understanding your life and purpose. It's absolutely a fantastic book. And here's a little excerpt. Um, we are now in a cosmic cycle that is allowing for accelerated karmic resolution and memory awakening. Forgiveness is the way to accomplishness. This is from the records themselves. So what I'd like to do now is to invite Angel onto the line with us. Good evening, Angel. Good evening. How are you? Can you hear me good? I can hear you perfectly. <laughs> can you hear me all right here? I, I can. I can. Thanks for having me on, Rebecca. Oh, you know, this is just going to be so much fun. Um, you know, I, uh, I do. Th I, I was I made the announcement about my uh, timeline regression workshop, mm -hmm. and one of the things that I do talk about in there, I don't take people through them, uh, but I do talk about the Akashic records uh, in there. And so this is going to be an extremely beneficial and uh, obviously a very timely topic, considering the transition uh, that's just taken place on this planet. Um, so what I'd love for you to do in the beginning here, because this is your first time uh, to this show, I, I hope at some time we'll have you back on. I just, I just sense that's the way this will be. Okay. Um, maybe you could share with everybody a little bit of, of, you know, kind of where you arrived at. You know, we, we, we have guests on and you show up and here's this book, but how did you get to this book? What was, you know, what was your personal journey kind of, uh, kind of say, you know, um, to bring you to, you know, this kind of very profound information that we're going to be talking about tonight. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll give you the short version. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I basically started on my path when I was very young. I was 19. And um, I had a, a tragedy. I was married, and my husband was uh, killed three months later. Oh. So I, I did this diversion, you know, where all of a sudden I wanted to know the details of his passing and where he was and so I went to my very first psychic and she ended up being 
my first teacher, and thankfully she was very, very well grounded and had uh, just uh, so much knowledge. So she set me right, you know. She set me on a good foundation, and then I, um, I just continued on that path. I got into everything that I could. I got into rebirthing and, of course, miracles and all, all anything metaphysical that had to do with consciousness and manifesting. So I also was a meditator. Uh, every day I would, when my children were taking naps, I'd, I'd take time to meditate. But I, I went in there asking my higher self for, for knowledge. I didn't go in to kind of still my mind. I wanted to be taught. So I had years of that. I was taught uh, so much about inner alchemy. And then one day I finally found, I just found myself in my records. And I was being shown a couple of my own lifetimes. And they were lifetimes that uh, either would show me abilities that I had or something that I still needed to resolve. Or they would help me understand something that was happening in my life today. But I couldn't get myself into my own records consciously. I, I didn't know how to do that. I would, I would just arrive at them by my guides taking me there. So I did take a, I sought out a teacher. I took a course. To learn how to get into the records and it was immediate I mean it was a, a special prayer that was taught to me and as soon as I said it uh, I was in that field of information so that switched me from being a tarot card reader for 35 years and teacher to an Akashic record reader and I started reading people privately I, I still do that today but the groups started the group akashic session started in ireland and they were really answers to pe questions people had about what was going on today on all kinds of different levels so i decided to pull everybody together in a group and give them an opportunity to uh ask the records what what's about it what's going on and those began a series of sessions which are ongoing to this day and so that first book that you're holding there is is the first book of it's called the, uh, basically it's a time of change because they're all the questions and answers that uh, were asked about things that are going on in the world today on a multiple variety of levels. So that's how I arrived there. Wow. Well, There's a lot in between, but that yeah. would take my mind. <laughs> yeah. That, that, you know, like I don't. There's not enough time in order to explain everything. You know. Uh, and, and it's interesting because some of your, um, uh, you know, some of the things that you've accomplished in your life and the things that you've done is has been kind of a similar path as my own. So it's very, uh, it's very nice to, you know, have those communications um, in regards to that, to know all of that. So how fantastic is that? You know, the Akashic Records, um, what I'd love for you to do is I know you, you, you spoke a little bit about them in regards to your own journey. But mm -hmm. what, you know, um, there, there's a lot, of, I think, a lot of um, maybe misunderstanding okay. about what they are. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of terms, as we well know, that's been, you know, thrown around, uh, esoteric or metaphysical terms. And then through the years, they kind of get diluted and uh, contaminated in their meanings mm -hmm. um, and, and misunderstood for sure. So right. maybe from your viewpoint, from your perspective, you would share with everyone what are the Akashic records? What would that mean to someone who uh, may be just starting out in their path uh, to try to access them? What would that mean to them on the Akashic records? What are they and, and what would it mean to them? All right. Well, the Akashic records, you know, the big picture of them is they're the recording or the history of all of creation so it isn't limited to let's say humans who would have their own particular library book of recordings about all of their lifetimes and all of their experiences since they were you know first shot off of the creator as a spirit so there is this intelligence out there that records every little minutest detail of life and every time creation happens and something new gets created, it goes into this database. It's the best way I can explain it. But 
you know, so you could call it a living memory as well of everything that's ever happened. And for people, you know, it's been called a vast library by some where each person has their own library book. And uh, I have gone into that aspect of it. And it really is like walking up a staircase and ending up in a library that has all these golden books. And the frequency of it is just incredible. And each one of us has our own. And there is a way you can go pull down your book and open it up and read it. All right. But that that was only in the initial stages. Uh, I don't. I'm not in that library anymore when I access the records. I'm just in a vast field of information. And I, I feel very non-local when I'm in it, you know, like I'm not in a particular spot. So to me, those records exist throughout all of creation. And even though people have said, you know, they're in a particular spiritual plane, a particular frequency band, I don't really experience them that way. I feel like I'm in the all that is when I access that field. So that's the best way I can explain it. But I will make a slight differentiation between what memory is and what the records are. And the ah, difference. The you difference, knew I was going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the difference seems to be is that there. What, when you're in the records, you're also in a field of relationships. And this is where I think God's source comes into the picture because, you know, if you ask the question, why would the intelligence of the universe bother to have something in it that would record, you know, the time streams of life? Well, I mean, what would be the point, okay? But to me, it has everything to do with the relationships we have with life and with the Creator. And when you're in the records, you can see that. You can see what, what the meaning is, what the purpose is, where if you just have a memory of a past life or a memory in general, you may not get that piece of it, okay? You might relive a, a past lifetime and kind of see a video, but you wouldn't necessarily always get uh, the whole purpose of your creation in that memory. Do you understand what I mean? Yep, I do. Okay. That, yeah, that's part of what uh, I walk people through a, to a point mm -hmm. in that, and then we continue working on that until we get that picture expanded. So I take them through yeah. in a step-by-step -step process opposed to arriving mm -hmm. at that larger space. Again, right. how do we word that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. And it, yeah, and what's interesting when I'm in a private reading is it's not like all of a sudden I'm in their records and I start rattling off all these lifetimes. Because sometimes that's not how how their mentors want to begin when they start talking to a soul about itself. So it could start out with color beams, for example, that are filled with data or can give me what the spirit essence of the person is like before we even go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Really. So let me share an ex I, What I want to do is I kind of want to correlate what you said about the Akashic records in in my own my own personal brief experience here okay. um, the first time I uh, accessed uh, my records these were my Akashic records um, and it's interesting because they were gold and mm -hmm. how they showed up instead of a library it showed up as a file cabinet okay and you know isn't it funny and mm -hmm. and by the way I was in this I was in the middle of uh, what what is termed as uh, as Atlantis, and it was uh, at, a, at a very volatile time in there. And I was told to go and access my records, as everything around me was kind of crumbling and doing all kinds of weird things. It was really very odd. And I ran into this room, and there's that file cabinet, and it's glowing with this golden glow like coming around what we would call the edges of it, the opening. And when I opened it up, there was this bright golden light. And here is all, I mean, literally, I pulled this file cabinet out, and I realized that I could pull it to infinity. Right. And I was like, and I became so overwhelmed with it. It's like, and what am I supposed to, what am I supposed to find in here? <laughs> and then, you know, I was like, okay. And it was like, I shut the, the file cabinet. I kind of bundled it up. And I kind of set it aside somewhere, right? 
-hmm. But now when I find myself out there exploring in, in, in that field, uh, I get the same sensation as you. I'm in a no space. Right. And yet all space. Yes. No Absolutely. space, all space. There's no edges. There's no uh, top. There's no bottom. There's no up. There's no down, right or left. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's ju you're just there. You're in this expansiveness, and it's kind of like watching um, a million screens coming across your view, but yet it doesn't become, like, disconcerting because it's not, like, moving at such a rapid pace or... It, it, it's very it's very difficult to explain the experience unless you've been there. Right, absolutely. Well, for me, too, I've only had the screens show up a couple times. Uh, not when I was in the records, but in different experiences that I had. Spontaneously, this little TV screen would show up. <laughs> <laughs> I love the TV screen, Matt. <laughs> okay. And, uh, but, you know, when I'm in the records, you know, I feel like I'm. it's all just there. Like, I don't, even though when I do report something to people, I, I get it in segments, okay? And it can, come in, it can come in colors, it can come in telepathy, mm -hmm. but I think most importantly, it gets impressed upon me all at once. So I feel like it becomes knowledge in my body as well as I hear it telepathy, I see it visually. But I have to report each segment. And they won't give me the next piece unless, <laughs> right, right, unless I tell a person everything they're saying. And you know, I remember the first time I saw something about somebody, and I said, "I can't tell them that." <laughs> and they said, "Well, you're not getting the next piece until you do." <laughs> so I'm like, "Great, okay." But uh, but it was very different than reading cards, for example, because I'm out of it really. I mean, I'm just reporting what they're saying and they they give me it you know with all the senses i feel it emotionally their meaning i feel the language is deliberate for each person uh words are seem to be chosen really carefully depending on who you're talking to mm. yeah so it's it's pretty incredible yeah it, 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 it is it's it's a, it's a beautiful thing it's a beautiful thing very it, i just love this is just a really great piece of conversation here let's 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 um i want to step off of that specific topic uh, topic we're going to get back to it obviously but let's okay. let's take a look at your overall if you don't mind an overall view take the um, listeners out there an overall view on the book of a time of change um there's a lot of information in this book um i mean a ton of information in this book um in your in, in, in the way that you are, obviously you were a participant in this, um, in, in the way that you would look at this, if you had to tell somebody what would be um, the gist, so to speak, of the content, what would you say about this book? <laughs> yeah, okay. that, that's hard. I know. I'm, I'm asking hard questions. Well, I I'm think so sorry. what I... No, that's the They're case. making me say these things. I'm you know, telling you. <laughs> You know, beside the fact that it's a variety of questions on a lot of different aspects, the point is, I, I believe, from that whole conversation with Source, is that God is alive and well. I, I, I think more than ever I have really realized that everything is okay, that no matter what is going on, everybody is loved and safe. But more than that, too... The book gives you so many different perspectives, and the advantage of having Source come through and talk to us was that Source would answer questions on a wide variety of levels. And what I, the only thing I can tell you is, when you get done reading it, you just have this sense of calm. You have this sense of uh, knowledge and something in your core that basically lets you know that everything's okay and everything's going to be okay. And I just find that so important because by understanding all the different levels that we experience things on, and you get to look at them from a much more expansive perception, you know, what you're left with really is that there's something else going on here that is much bigger than all of our problems. 
and that's the best thing I can say that I've gotten out of out of that conversation with Source and the questions that people have asked. Is I'm so, so sure that there is a Source and that I'm loved and that the core of me can communicate with that anytime I choose. Um, you know, it goes above and beyond all the little things we worry about every day, even though it addresses them. Right. So for the listeners out there, what I want to do is kind of give an, uh, a little idea of some of the contents of this book that you have covered. You talk about um, who we are, why we are here, our organic true selves. You talk about health, Western medita- medicine, as well as alternative therapies, uh, suicide and mental illness, uh, food and water, artificially engineered viruses, Earth changes, solar flares, and technology. Uh, Earth and the ending of evil. Indigo, crystal, and rainbow children. Numbers and DNA strand. Extraterrestrials, prosperity. You have messages in there from Mother Mary, uh, our future selves, uh, symbolism in your everyday life. I mean, it, it covers a broad spectrum of literally how we experience uh, our physicality. Yes, that's right. In fact, you know, the night Mother Mary came in was quite a surprise because I'm really, there really weren't any other beings that actually wanted to come and talk to us. I mean, when we would open the records, depending on the conversation, we'd have light beings that would come in and listen. We'd have orbs that would come in and listen. But we never had anybody who wanted to speak to us other than source itself. So this particular night I had all these questions that I wanted to ask about ascension. I had a huge long list. And I never got to any of them because suddenly Mary was there and she said, ask my permission to speak. Wow. First of all, you know, may I speak? And then she asked me what I consider putting what she had to say in this book. And it was... It was such a holy night, you know, and I'm I'm somebody, you know, I call myself a recovering Catholic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Okay, so for her to come in and appear as she did because she appeared as a 14-year-old girl, and yet I got the full presence. I got the fact that she was a girl and a woman and a holy person, and behind her were all these long stream of holy women that came with her. Oh, wow. And she wanted to talk to us, uh, one, about the holy women, and then it was all about the balance between male and female energy and how that operates inside of us. So I'll, I'll give you a little story about that because one of the things people asked was, how can we balance the male and female within ourselves? Exactly. And what she said was, meditate on the sun and the moon inside your body and meditate on the star Bethlehem. Well, okay, so I just said, all right, put it in the book. But then I found out about six to eight months later that the sun and the moon is the pineal and the pituitary gland. And the star Bethlehem is a little seed that's in our solar plexus that actually gets fertilized every month when our astrological sign goes, or or the moon goes into our astrological sign. It actually gets fertilized. And, and grows and allows us to uh, have a particular type of liquid secrete from our pineal gland that helps us uh, come into enlightenment. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, but she didn't explain all that part. She just said, <laughs> so, meditate on the sun, the moon, and the star Bethlehem. So here I'm looking, after I get the message, I'm online, I'm looking up the star Bethlehem, and there were people that says, oh, it's it's Nibiru. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, she can't mean Nibiru. <laughs> she, she can't mean to meditate on Nibiru. So I mean, but I'm glad I... <laughs> but I'd have... never heard that, so that one's new for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Battleship Bethlehem, I guess. There, <laughs> there you go. But uh, but to find out that the sun and the moon, I mean, really, if you think about it, not externally, but, of course, as above, so below, right? Yeah. 
So here's the sun and the moon internally, and uh, the sun would be the pineal, and the moon would be uh, the pituitary, one being electrical and the other being magnetic in terms of glands. And here she's talking about our need to balance these two poles inside of ourselves. So I, I thought that was pretty fascinating, yeah. You know, that is actually really fascinating when you start thinking about it in frequencies and uh, resonant fields and things like that. That makes sense, and, and the whole physics behind that. Uh, that really is uh, extraordinarily interesting if you look at it even from just the scientific viewpoint of that and how, how much sense that makes um, in, in uh, correlation with the human body. Fascinating. Right. Yeah, and I actually started to do it. And, you know, what I did was I just closed my eyes and just focused on those two glands and, you know, acknowledged acknowledged them, just acknowledged the sun and the moon inside myself. And you really do start to feel changes happen in your body like right away you know i'm um, uh, uh, listening to you and and by the way you really project wonderful visuals it's beautiful um uh and i'm looking at this little view that i've that i've been given here and i'm like you know i think that is an important uh, meditation so you know i'm i'm certainly uh going to try that myself and see how that does in order to you know, create that equity within the within the physical form, uh, because that also helps on the spiritual. It helps on all levels: emotional, spiritual, mental. Uh, okay. When 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 you work on one level, you're working on all levels. It doesn't matter whether you're consciously aware of it or not. Uh, so that's uh, that's actually really good information there. Wow. Yeah, even if you just focus on the star Bethlehem in your solar plexus too. Yeah. You know, and I, what I love about these sort of messages is because they're not given with a description. They're not given to say, well, if you meditate on the Star of Bethlehem, you're going to have this experience or you're going to see this. And she's not telling us to visualize anything except the Star of Bethlehem. But when you do it, all of a sudden things start changing in that part of your body too. And then every person has their own experience. Mm, yeah, yeah, that we're also very unique, aren't we? It's, it's, yeah, we are. Um, a question did come in. I usually don't take them, you know, as I told you before we started the show until the second hour. Okay. But I didn't, I didn't want to get us too far off course and then have to have you come back and try to answer this mm-hmm. one. Somebody's asking if you uh, can, throw, she can throw some light on who Mary really is and what she's really all about. Did she, have you spoken with her since then? I mean, did, she, did you get any... Um, you know, expansion on that with her about well, she, well, she came in the following week. Oh, uh, good. But that was it, you see. And I can tell you the feeling I have about her. Perfect. You know, someone someone did ask her, did she live other lives on Earth? And she did say yes, that she, she was uh, part of Atlantis. Uh, she was in Egypt, that she showed herself to me as a small child in Egypt just running through the streets. And she basically um, told me that she, see, she said she was one of the golden ones. Mm. And, okay, so now I have to go into, uh, you know, frequencies and harmonics because that's the feeling that I got from her. Okay. That there is a group of beings that you couldn't really assign them to a planet, let's say, you know? Like, Like if you say, where'd you come from? I... I couldn't feel a planet, but what I could feel was a harmonic. Right. And it looks like there were certain beings that vibrated at a particular golden harmonic. Mm-hmm. And they were called the golden ones. And what she said to me was that even though people would say that she was a Melchizedek, right? She said she wanted to go back even further than that and almost like say, well, let's not dwell on that because what I really am is I'm from this golden harmonic. Okay. And it's a sound tone frequency, and it vibrates to just this incredible feeling of absolute love. And that's what you get from her. Okay? So I became less interested in, was she really the mother of Jesus? Even though, of course, somebody had to say, you know, were you really a virgin? (laughs) (laughs) And she chuckled, and she said, isn't that a personal question? (laughs) Okay, but anyway. I love uh, that. She did go on to explain um, that she did live that lifetime, and she gave birth to this child, but he wasn't her first. And 
I didn't put that part in the book. Uh, it might be in another book. There was a history there. Mm-hmm. But but I don't think she really wanted me to focus on her being an icon in a religion right. or the mother of a being called Jesus. She was from the Golden Ones. And I'll jump ahead real quick for your listeners' sake because in the section on Indigo Crystal and Rainbow Children, somebody had asked the question, was, was were there going to be other advanced children beyond the rainbows? And they said, yes, the golden ones have yet to come. Mm. And what was interesting is they said it would still be about ten years uh, before they would come in, but they feel exactly of the same place, if I can call it a place, that you would say Mary and maybe some other uh, special beings would come from. And I feel like she wasn't uh, unique to Earth either. You know, that she would go to many civilizations and uh, interact with beings from many different places for specific reasons. You know, just like avatars would. You know, when they, they appear for a reason, they come for a reason. Uh, but really, she feels uh, such a perfect balance of male and female energy because along with the, I mean, I had it all in one. I had the little girl, I had the adolescence, I had the mother, and I also had a being of vast knowledge and scientific information. She was a perfect balance. Hmm. So, I don't what know a, if What that... a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Yeah. Truly. So, you know, all of this is very interesting um, because as you were talking, I'm like, I think the next thing I want to talk to her about is the indigo crystal and rainbow children. And you started talking about the rainbow children. It's like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, because the whole child thing kind of spurned that. So if he, so I'm going to go ahead and ask the question. Um, yeah. and maybe you can explain uh, briefly for the audience, in, in your opinion, what is an indigo, a crystal, and a rainbow child? What's the difference between them? Okay. All right, well, the indigos, when I brought that question to the records, I heard all this giggling. <laughs> I heard all these little innocent voices giggling. And that's the best way, too, that I couldn't place them in terms of, oh, they come from the Pleiades, for example. Do you know? Yeah. I yeah. place a planet with them. They were very close to source. They felt young in their in their essence, very pure, very innocent little beings. And, you know, they were coming here basically to bring that to Earth, that just as pure love. And so if we go back and we think about the hippies, you know, Mm -hmm. those of us that were hippies, and um, that's when a lot of the indigos started to come in, you know, in groups, in big groups, because... Before that, we'd still have a smattering of them. You know, some of the old geniuses were indigo children, okay? Mm-hmm. But the hippies, I'd say, were the first big boost where a lot came in. And it really was, you know, it was all about love. It was all about peace. And, and that's the point, that they were trying to lay this foundational grid down so that they could, you know, set up a, a web around the earth that would be very, very loving and very pure. Okay, so from them, you know, recently we've had these crystal children come in, and they also felt like they, I couldn't place them either in a planet, but they were at a really different harmonic frequency than the indigos. It was like they would, they were more advanced. They had had more, um, well, let me just say they were more mature, Mm -hmm. even though they, they, you know, I think I put it in the book where instead of toddlers, they felt like, young children. Okay. Right, right. Gotcha. Just an example, okay? Right. But in a way, they they do springboard off of the indigos. In other words, you could say that some of the crystals would have been indigos in the past. And what they've done is they've come in here because we've now completed, the indigos completed this foundational web so that biologies could change. So now we see it. Now we have kids coming in that are really a new species. They're a new species of child. They're a new species of human. You know, they have they have more DNA turned on. Their brains work more completely than ours do. And uh, they're more in harmony. And you've got these genius children with incredible gifts. 
But they, too, are coming here. But this is all part of the mapping of the new Earth. All of this is. And, and what I'm delighted about is that they're proof that it's working. All right, so I'm going to stop you there. Mapping of the new Earth. What does that phrase mean? All right. Well, it means that we are at a time when the Earth is changing and all of the species on the planet are changing, Mm -hmm. which means that the normal human that we've been used to with our five senses for, you know, millions of years is now being upgraded to incorporate more abilities, more gifts, more genius, if you will, okay? So we're, we're evolving to a higher species, and our crystalline structure in our bodies is changing also. It's going, uh, the best way I can explain it is that the spin rate in the crystals in your body is, gonna, is getting faster. Right, accelerating, or, or accelerating. Move, yeah, accelerating, uh, yeah. So we are going through a purification, no doubt about it. Okay, this is this does involve a huge planetary and species purification. Okay, so that does mean, and you know, I don't want to bring religion into this because their version of the purification is Armageddon, you know, where many people get wiped off the planet. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a, a purification in a way where the frequency of everything in your cells, in your blood, and everything gets upgraded. And now you're suddenly more telepathic, and that's happening. And people, you know, especially since December, right? manifestation is happening instantaneously. Thoughts are being passed back and forth much faster. Right. People that would have been asleep to all of that are finally noticing it. Um, you're watching people either get really ill and leave or have these miraculous healings you're having a mixed bag okay and that's a compatibility issue you know if you if you leave the planet because you can't integrate you know these changes in your body you know your body will say uh, okay I, I'm not up for it you know right right uh, I'll see you later okay mm-hmm. <laughs> okay but that's that's the mapping of the new earth that the, this earth is now changing okay it's all the species some will die out you'll see new ones come in that's already happening Right. Uh, you know, plant life will change. Trees will change. Everything's going to uh, be different. And we have yet to see how that will unravel and show itself. But we are seeing evidence of it already, and that does bring us back to these kids. They are the living proof of it. And they are. Um, I mean, you know, um, wow, I even seen it in my own children. Of course, they're grown, and then I had grandchildren. I've seen uh, that be different than my children from, you know, when I, I was growing up. I mean, you can, it, it was extraordinarily noticeable when you know what you're, you know, when you can see that, you know, it, it really is. So, back to the children. Uh, of course, rainbow children, I'd love to hear about that. And somebody is, I have had this question of, of several guests, by the way, about okay. the diamond children. Okay. So, um, I'll let you take it away. Okay. Well, I have not heard of the Diamond Children, um, so that's a new one for me. But I will go in and ask, but I mean, I'll see if I can get an answer before I finish explaining about the Rainbow Children. All right, but the Rainbow Children, you know, they're, they're like little baby avatars. And they really would be Christed beings that are coming here now to lay down this uh, foundation of pure peace. So if you could imagine little Buddhas coming in, you know, Mm -hmm. little little Christ coming in who are, they're not naive at all, but they're very pure and innocent. And they're here just to bring the power of that truth to earth. And they are actually the ones, because of what they're doing, that is trying to move us into almost like a, collective of planets that really works off the Christ principle. And there are not a lot of them here. And uh, I heard a story a couple years ago, and maybe you've heard it also. I don't remember where I heard it, but it was about this rainbow child being born. And it was just a a normal woman, a normal mom. But yet when this child came out, all of a sudden the doctor and the nurses knelt down. They were in awe of this child. You know, they were just overstruck by, you know, 
the peace coming off of this child. They, they considered it a holy person. And that's how you would feel with a rainbow child. Mm -hmm. You would get this sense of awe that you were in the presence of, you know, a being that was, was holy is the best way I can explain it. Right. Sacred. <laughs> Sacred. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 I'm, so I'm understanding that. Yeah. So I can't answer the diamond question, unfortunately, because um, I wasn't aware of them and I haven't asked. So maybe they could enlighten me a little. <laughs> you know, um, and again, this, like I said, this is, you know, um, this question has been asked of several of my guests that's been on. Okay. And um, the answers, by the way, have all been pretty much the same. Um, so I'm not sure where the information is coming from. Obviously, it's coming from somewhere. People wouldn't be asking about it. We just haven't arrived there for the information yet. All uh -huh. right. Well, it's a good question that I can put in, my, in one of my groups because I, I wasn't aware of them. I, I, I yeah. part of thought that the crystals were similar to diamonds, but maybe they aren't. Well, that's kind of how what I got, too, but yet when I, it's like I can't, like, totally get into it, but I, I get this overall impression that um, there's a, a similarity, like maybe they come from, maybe they're a higher grouping of what you would call uh, uh, the crystal children. Maybe they're more ascended in some manner, but yet they're not the same either. It's kind of a strange way of saying yeah. that because it sounds like, you know, Sounds like gobbledygook, but that's what it feels like. You know, that's really all I can go by as well. Well, I will bring it to source. I will bring that question to source because it's a good one. Well, wonderful. And then next time you come on, we'll, we'll have, have an well, answer. Maybe you'll have an answer, and that'd be fantastic. We, you know, <laughs> we'll all we'll have some more information. So <laughs> okay, great. You know, um, let's talk a little bit. Uh, we've got about I don't know about ten minutes or so before the top of the hour. Okay. Um, and you know. You, you talked a little bit about mapping the new earth. Let's talk about, you know, what's what's been showing up. I need to be real careful how I word this. What's been showing up um, in, in our uh, in our perceptions of what's has been transpiring on this earth. We've got uh, the chemtrails. We've got a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals out there. We've got uh, viruses that are being manufactured. Um, we've got this whole barrage of, of like poisoning our waters, um, all of that that, that that seems to be very, very detrimental um, to the human species, and yet we continue to survive and thrive. And right. I, w I would love to hear what your information has been. In regards to, the, it's very extreme. If you look at this, it's very extreme. People like you and me, and many of the listeners out there, you know, I don't buy into all of that. You know, I don't. I, I mean, I know it exists out there, but I don't buy into it. I don't have an attachment to it. Um, I simply choose to lead, live my life differently than that. What people focus on, which are all of these things, it doesn't mean they don't exist. But I try not to bring that into my space. I, I think that's a good way of saying that. But these are things that seem to be going on globally um, around around the globe. And what's what's the take on some of that, if you don't mind? I don't mind, but it's going to take more than ten minutes. Okay, so <laughs> Wait, no, I, we, no, I just tease it. <laughs> well, yeah, it's going to. I know it, that uh, that was a. I know a lot of a lot of different <laughs> topics there. I understand. So we'll get through what we can, and then we'll pick it up after the break. If you're still. You know, if you're if you're still conversing about it, that's fine. Okay. We're not well, in a hurry. We're going to just talk about what needs to be talked about. That's okay. Uh, this is one of those uh, situations where there's many levels to it. And what Source has told us is that the time of evil is over. And I know people will go, well, geez, look at everything. You know, the one world order is advancing and, you know, just uh, all the stuff you just listed is happening. But sources made it really clear that these things are not going to survive. Mm -hmm. And, okay, now we're in a process, though. This is not an overnight event, okay? But this is, you know, I, if I could use the word, it feel, felt to me that there was a breaking point, you know, where source says, okay, uh, you've been allowed to be a free will planet for X amount of eons, and that was a grand experiment, but uh, the, the nasties were allowed to live there and do their thing as well. 
but basically time's up. Okay, because what happened on in December was this huge blessing was spread across the universe, and I saw it. Mm, yes. I saw it. I came right from source. It wasn't coming from the sun. It was coming, or from the center of our galaxy, it was coming from source itself, and it yeah. went out to all life everywhere, not just us. Yeah. Okay, so we've been given this blessing, which, and this influx of light, which has intensified and increased, and that is what is catalyzing all of these changes that I just talked about biologically and on the earth uh, in the species and everything. Okay, so when we talk about what's going on with the food, for example, okay, now sources said to us, uh, yeah, it, it, it was very realistic and said, you do need to watch for these, these types of foods. They are poison. Uh, what it is is it's an attempt to artificialize uh, your body from an organic living living organism to an artificial uh, construct you know they're, they're trying to deaden the organic life force in us because they know it's being catalyzed and waking up okay mm -hmm. so they're doing everything they can to destroy that and it does affect the stomach and the liver those foods and uh, so it isn't anything to not pay attention to but source basically says you know one of the issues is our dependence on, you know, outside forces to provide our food. And this is, when you look at this whole big action that's happening, we really are being asked to move from a society that is dependent, codependent on big, big brother, big pharma, you know, huge chains of grocery stores, and bring it down to either our individual land or a community. It's basically saying this is the time you, you've got to be self-sustaining. Okay, you've got to find out what that is because self-mastery and self-sustenance self are the same thing. So it, it does encourage us. You know, Source did say you do need to get organic seeds. Uh, you need to have those and get them while you can. If you get, you know, grow a garden or have meetings in your community where you do those you know, the co-op farms where people go out and everybody participates. There's ways around what's happening is what Source kept saying, but it does require a different action on our part. Okay, so, and the thing with water, water's pretty interesting because water holds memory. And so we're all sitting around a dinner table, let's say, and we're having this huge conversation, and we're, we're, getting into the negative agenda we're having a conversation about the viruses and all that and then we all go take a drink of our water at the table well we've just ingested our conversation and that water would have the potential to make all of us you know potentially sick okay so this is part of the whole consciousness shift that we need to understand that you know Water is a huge potential for miraculous change because it does hold our thoughts. Okay, you go hold a glass of water, you project a thought into it, and that water starts to change its structure and it affects you differently. And, you know, it affects all bodies of water differently. So there's, there's many, many things that we can be doing. Uh, even in terms of food, Source has always said, well, why don't you get up at sunrise and go out and look at the sun as it's rising for 20 or 30 seconds. Just do some sun gazing because the sun right now is regenerative. You know, what's happening to the sun is it's changing also. It has these new light code elements in it, and they come into our atmosphere. But if you take that in and understand that that's food, you know, it doesn't mean I'm not telling everybody to stop eating. But I'm saying that if you were to get up and do that, you would find that you're not as hungry through the day, that you're centered, that you're clear, and you just got fed by prana. You got fed by color and light and sound. And that's what our bodies are made of. Okay, so, yeah, we, we do have all of these nasty things going on, and they're not about to uh, give up the ghost anytime soon the corporations aren't going to change uh, 
the banks aren't going to change. We can't hope for them to suddenly come over to the sane side and start working cooperatively without greed because that's not their that's not their motives. So the change has to come in small ways, in small communities, and I do know for a fact that there are communities being established where they're making their own money system, they're buying their own food. Uh, there's huge projects going on across the globe. There, there's a project, I, I don't know if it's in Russia, I may not have the country correct, but they built this huge city based on pyramidal energy. There's a huge white pyramid in the center of the, the city, and all of the the, medis, the medical, the uh, farming, everything is sustainable. Everything is grouped around this harmonic cooperative energy, and that has to be the way of the future. You know, our big problem, Rebecca, is we've just been codependent for too long. Yeah, we've been very lethargic as a, a race, as a species here. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more. And, yeah. you know, I, I have to say, I, I put in my two cents here, um, the whole com- building community um, thing has been... Uh, been talked about and, and been implemented for the last several years in earnest. Um, and uh, I had a guest on uh, uh, last week, and we were talking about um, community, and she said, this isn't like the old hippie communes. No. Uh, this, is, this is about getting out, knowing your neighbors, and doing exactly what you're talking about, is, is, is becoming um, responsible, taking responsibility for your own life uh, and and also by reaching out and working with others. So it's learning to get past, regardless of whether, I mean, you and I can disagree about whether to drive a vehicle or not drive a vehicle. We can disagree about, uh, you know, many different things. But we put those disagreements aside because you and I are going to go out there and we're going to work in this garden that you and I are going to benefit from. We'll each take uh, food from that and take it home and feed ourselves and our family with that. And we right. do this out of love, love for each other and respect of the differences as well as the similarities because we truly are all in this together. We are, yes. And we have to really, really recognize that this is how we connect uh, not mm-hmm. only to each other, but this is how we find our way back to source. Right, this is exactly. How we, we make that connection because this planet was clearly designed to sustain us. Absolutely. As long as we honor. All right, everyone, welcome back. You are listening to Journeys with Rebecca, and we're here tonight with my guest, Anne Gail O'Grady, Rose O'Grady, rather. Uh, we have been talking about her book called A Time of Change, as well as. A, a, just a ton of information. Welcome back, and Gail. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> this has just been really fun so far, and it's just went by really fast, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Must be yeah. all them spinning crystals, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, let's. I would love for you to maybe let's expound a little bit on the water thing. You know, I, I kind of gave you, I dumped a whole bunch of stuff there just before the top of the hour. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's something uh, that I haven't had uh, people on talking too much about is about the water thing. Uh, back in the early 90s, um, I ran across some information on water um, about how uh, experiments were being done uh, by uh, some wonderful scientists uh, that have groups meditating uh, on, uh, on, you know, small uh, flasks of water with different ingredients in them, uh, and and they would meditate on it. And then they would retest this water, and the water would be clear. Uh, it would be drinkable again. It would be purified, in other words. Uh, and the scientist kept moving his um, experiments into bigger and larger vessels or containers until finally they went to a very, very polluted lake. And again, I don't remember. You know, I've slept since the 1990s. Um, so I'm not remembering the exact small lake that they went to, but it was one of the most polluted lakes at that time on the planet. And there were a group of people that sat around this lake and meditated uh, on this lake. And it was maybe several days later, if I remember the article right, uh, in which uh, the water cleared up, 
Uh, they took test samples of it, and the water became purified again. In other words, it was taken back to its what would have been its original state of of being. Right. And um, so it's very interesting. We forget. We take it for granted. What water really is, and maybe you'd like to expand a little bit before we move into some other topics. Well, you know, years ago when I would meditate, I was actually taught by Archangel Raphael for five or six years, and that connection happened accidentally. It wasn't anything I was calling on. You know, I was in trouble, and it it came through a friend. But the very first thing Raphael said to me was, in one molecule you are. And I remember pondering on that for years and years. What does he mean? What does it he, she mean? It was actually androgynous. But I think it literally means that, you know, we are really one one drop or one flame of spirit essence. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you read, go back to Genesis and you read the accounts of Genesis, it's all about coming through different layers or levels of water. Mm-hmm. You know, the upper water, the lower water, the middle water, uh, and there's, of course, they're talking about water on various levels, and water takes different forms and shapes depending on the frequency levels that you're at. But the fact that water responds to our thoughts, and if you think about how we how we create a, a body, all right, or why is somebody's body a certain way and somebody else's is different, and you know what happens to your body in terms of health or illness. A lot of that has to do with the quality of our consciousness and our thoughts. Because, you know, Source talked to us one time about death. And somebody asked the question, why do we die? And Source came back and said, well, you die because the water in your body is polluted. Wow. <laughs> and I, th- I thought that was such an interesting answer. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. So it seemed to imply that, you know, quality of the water in our body is dependent on our thinking, our emotions, and, you know, how spiritual we are, are we really working on our, our lives, you know? It's not so much about the food you're eating because, you know, we've done experiments with food also. I can talk about that later. But getting back to the water, because water holds memory, like I mentioned before the break, and it will hold the con- Conversation and it will hold your thoughts and it will. You drink a thing of water and it can be the purest water in the world. But if you are, uh, if your consciousness is full of judgmental and negative thoughts, it's just going to change its crystalline pattern in your body and, and make a cell, you know, in accordance with your consciousness. So I just think, on the one hand, you know, if you become a conscious creator with your water. And you're aware that this is vital life fluid. And it, it has the ability to shape shift according to your intention. I, I think that's, you know, there are people who've been healed of all sorts of illnesses just, just by doing that and by drinking water. You know, it, so it, it's a powerful fluid and it has my, I got an inkling uh, with Source that water is the common denominator through many, many levels of creation. And I certainly have found myself in meditation and other places where the waters were different colors or they had a different consistency to them. You know, I don't know if you've experienced anything like that yourself. Have you? Yes, actually I have. Uh, When I was growing up, uh, we had well water. We pumped it right from the ground. Um, It didn't come through the city. It just came right up from the ground. And I remember thinking how that water was it had like a consistency to it and it had like a sweetness to it and I've drank water from other places and it's it's like you know it sounds so silly it's not it's just really really thin (laughs) I understand it has no body it has no substance to it It, some of it tastes very foul to me when you know, I, I can't even drink it. I can't use it to make tea or I can't use it to make anything with it because it has this foul flavor to it. Well, I know even earlier I used to get all the different colors of bottles and I'd fill them with water and I'd put them out in the sun. And then after a day or two, you'd 
you pour that water into a glass, each color tasted entirely different. Oh, yeah. But it all had, it all had a nice, pure taste to it, though, once you put it in a bottle and it went through a color spectrum from the sunlight. You know, the, the water was completely different than when it came out of the tap. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I, yeah, it's, it's a real uh, powerful medium for sure. And I just think, you know, the phrase they give me is it's vital life fluid. Yeah, I like that. I'm, I, 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 I think I need to hang on to that, uh, that phrase there for myself. Um, uh, you know, we, we sometimes get so busy with all the things that we do, we, we forget about the little things sometimes. And the little things are sometimes the biggest things. Yeah, it's simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's very simple. <laughs> very simple to be conscious of your water. And uh, the last, after I got this information from Source, the last time I was at a dinner, the conversation with one of the women, you know, she turned a bit negative, and all of a sudden I became very aware of the water, and I thought, I can't drink my water. Yeah. <laughs> Done with that. <laughs> Like you just become aware now. All these little glasses of water are listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was some story years oh. years ago about these scientists um, who were actually hired by governments to get together in this conference and produce some biological viruses. And you know, all these scientists were in this conference and they broke for a break, and suddenly they all got very ill. All of them started throwing up and it displayed, you know, symptoms of food poisoning. But none of them had had anything to eat. And the only thing they, the only common denominator was they all drank the water on their tables. (laughs) I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh at somebody else's uh, maladies there, but hey. (laughs) Yeah, I know. You're right. Hey. Hey there. Maybe you better rethink what you're doing. Uh, and that's what I call instant karma, baby. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's a good story. I like that one. <laughs> I'll recall that on later shows. I guarantee you that. <laughs> that's cute. Well, you know, um, so you you were talking, and I don't know if you're not if you're if you need to continue on with the water thing, we can. And I know you uh, briefly mentioned something about food as well, so. Yes, what was I going to say about food now? I forgot. I completely forgot, to be honest. Oh, I, I think I was making the point. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. Um, I was doing teaching a class some years back, and one of the things, it was it was kind of an intuitive class, you know, to get people right. a, a little bit psychic, you know. Right. So I, what I did was I brought food in, uh, all kinds of food. I, I bought organic fruit. I bought yellow processed cheese. I brought Oreo cookies and crackers and everything and everybody chose a piece of food and we were all meditating on it with the purpose of to see if we could identify the vibration that it was functioning at and I was so surprised because when people came out of that what happened was everybody got the same message you know for example somebody was holding a grapefruit the grapefruit told them that you know it had so many sections so that it could feed more than one person Okay, the yellow processed cheese went back to the cow that gave the milk, who was just happy to give his milk. The great, the uh, processed crackers went back to the wheat field, and the wheat was saying um, that it was just happy to be able to give its grain. So every single piece of food, no matter if it was chemically altered, if it was processed, all had the same message. It all went back to the origin of the giver, and the giver all said, you know, this was a this is like an extension of love to be able to share what it had with with everybody else, and I was really shocked about that because we make so much judgments about food. And I remember Sandra Ray years ago; she put out this book called "The Only Diet There Is." I don't know if you remember that, mm. but it was all about looking at her thoughts around food. Okay, and she uh, she loved sausage. But she wouldn't let herself eat it because, of course, you know, full of fat and all this and that. So she finally started working with uh, the, the thing that everything is the result of your thoughts. And she said, well, is it or isn't it, you know? And so she played with it. And she wrote a whole book that was a workbook on just working through your 
thoughts and beliefs about food because it came from the place that food doesn't have the power to harm you. It's your thoughts about it and your emotions about it that do that, okay? So interesting concept even though we're talking about the GMO foods, but I don't know that they're really organic in the way that I'm talking, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, um, when you're talking about GMO, you're, you're, you're actually talking about something that it actually has been altered and is it in its natural yes. state. Yes. Um, you know, and I'll give you a little piece of, of, of maybe a correlation here. I have a lady that comes on every once in a while. Uh, she actually does... Uh, she does a very unusual type of, like, aura readings. They're not, like, okay. color things, right? She called me a few years ago and said, oh, my gosh, I just have to come on your show. I have to talk to you about this cloned beef thing. I was like, okay, you remember when cloned beef came out? Mm-hmm. Um, and she said that she was uh, traveling. She was going from, uh, she was going to attend some uh, some function. And so she was driving along, and uh, there was this whole field of cows, and she said it was the strangest thing. She said they didn't have any auras. None of them had oh auras. God. She said it was just bizarre. And she said and we kept driving along. She said pretty soon there was a sign uh, up on this where these cattle were that said this was uh, a, a farm uh, for the growth of cloned beef. You know, something mm-hmm. to that effect. It wasn't exactly like that, but that's what it was. And then, of course, then she drives along, and then on the other side of this farm was the regular cattle. Now, they all had auras. And she said she was so astounded that she had to kind of stop her car. She had to go back because she really couldn't believe what her eyes couldn't see. (laughs) Because she sees. Um, Right. She senses. And the cloned beef does not have the same life force. That's right. And so when we look at at, um, foods that are cloned, genetically right. altered in a negative way, in other words, are uh, chemically, artificially, uh, yeah. without life force, uh, mm-hmm. we don't get those nutrients from it because it doesn't have the same life force. So I would tell you that that uh, that experiment that you did with all those people years ago was probably before the massive right. influx of the GMOs and the cloned yes. uh, beef yes. and all of that. So Yes, it was, yep. And it's not that I would, it's, and, and, and I just want to add this, it's not that I would dishonor a cloned beef as a sentient being any more than I would a regular cow. Mm-hmm. Um, because for me, they're a living creature regardless of where they arrive from. Yeah, but I think I won't, you do make I won't it, ingest I, it. <laughs> yes, I know. And I do think you make a really good point, though, about cloned animals because I, I do believe this we had this discussion once with source about cloned animals and the way it explained it was that it didn't have a soul right <laughs> in the same way and, and that was similar to what you're saying mm-hmm. you know that it did, didn't have a particular um, life force energy but you know it is a bit of a concern when you think about it when I mention the negative agenda's attempt to artificialize the human body. Mm-hmm. You know, they really are trying to downstep us. Right. And, um, you know, make us, you know, similar to what you just described with the beef. Right. You're just yeah. trying to do it through through food that doesn't, that actually uh, destroys our organic function. So, anyway. Well, it does, and there's not an exchange there. Um, you know, a lot of people have been very, very judgmental and biased about whether you eat meat or not eat meat. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of people that have judgment about that, and whether you're, a vegan or not, the right. point is is that these these creatures that are these beautiful sentient beings um, came here, agreed to be here, to be life force. The Mother Earth gives them life by them eating the uh, food that comes from there, whether it be grass, grain, oats, whatever it is. Uh, mm-hmm. They in turn give us milk and they in, sometimes in turn give us meat. But it's they're giving their life because the life that they've received from these plants, which are also sentient beings, or oats or grain or whatever it is that they're ingesting, it's a it's an exchange of life force for life force for life force. It is the natural process that goes on here on this planet. That's the way it was designed. But I do think we are moving out of that, Rebecca. I do. I, I think I, I have yeah. to agree. I think we're becoming more more less. Uh, focused on the meat consumption 
as we are the uh, plant and fruit consumption uh, is moving in in more of a higher gear than it ever has. Yeah, and I do, you know, you make a good point, you know, with the judgments about veganism and vegetarian and, um, you know, did you ever read, what's his name, uh, I hate it when I can't remember names, the one who wrote the source field investigation, David Wilcock. Yes. Okay, well, you know, in there he's talking about the researches that this scientist did with plants in his laboratory, remember? Yep. Okay, but here's these plants screaming, you know. Yes. I mean, they're, they're screaming when they're getting cut. So, you know, when people use the logic that where they say, well, you're killing a, a living creature when you're eating meat, and but the same is true with plant life. That's right. And, and I just think, you know, we really do have to get it that everything is conscious. And, and everything and, feels, you know? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when I go out and plant my garden, and I go and I start pulling off the fruits, whatever they are, I always mm-hmm. tell it, thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm now going to, to pick this, this fruit from, from your vine. I'm going to ingest it. And I always, when I plant the seeds, I give it love. I go, when I tend the garden, I give it love. Mm-hmm. When it gives me that love in return, which is the fruit, whatever it is, mm-hmm. um, I say thank you. Right. And when I come into the house and prepare it, whether I cook it or just, you know, season it or whatever I'm doing with it, I'm going to tell you my, my food tastes 500 times better than it ever did. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I see that completely. And it makes me think of an, another woman who's one of my favorites, Penny Kelly. Have you heard of her? I have not, no. Penny, Penny Kelly is the coolest. But anyway, <laughs> she wrote a book called uh, The Elves of Lily Hill. And it's about the elves that show themselves to her on her property. And here's a woman who was a, she's a doctorate. She was very logical. Out and bought this farm that had all these vineyards. And it was going for a stroll one day. And next thing you know, she hears these little voices that, you know, start chatting with her. And uh, eventually she accepts that they're living creatures on her land. In fact, she actually got to the point where not only she could see them, with her physical eye, but she could see their whole civilization. Oh, wow. How and, fun was that? Yeah. So the book is all about how they taught her how to garden and work with nature and mm-hmm. increase her vineyard uh, yield by planting pear and peach trees in the area. I mean, stuff that we'd never think of. Okay, so there's that whole other aspect, too, when we talk about, you know, moving into this new paradigm where we're not only becoming more telepathic beings, but those veils that have kept us perceiving so separately, you know, once they break down, there's there's a whole, there's so many other realities going on here that we're not even connected to because we just don't focus our attention there. Exactly, and and the more that we become perceptive of our environment, the more we begin to see this unseen world that we've been sharing space with all this time. Yes. And, you know, I want to kind of get back to the plant thing before we move on. You know, um, when uh, I always, I feel just as bad when one of my plants die in my garden as I would another creature passing. Yes. I feel just just as sad. And, and, you know, watch people just rip plants up from the ground and they just, and and you can just hear the plants screaming. You really can. Um, you, well, you can feel them, and you just kind of go, and, and you think that's okay. <laughs> rip it from its ground. Just rip it right out of there. <laughs> well, you know, when I was younger, I thought I always wanted to work in a flower shop. So I finally got a job in a flower shop. And my job was that I had to put the wire in the roses so they'd stand up straight. Right. And I couldn't do it. I lasted two days because I all I heard was them scream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I stick this wire in them and they go, oh, you know. Ouch, that hurts. That really hurts. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I can't do this. The lady thought I was crazy, but I, I didn't. I didn't tell her why. I just said, I just can't do this. So I'll see ya. And she's like, huh? It's not that bad of a job. You think? Like, yeah, but you can't hear them scream like I can. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, let's move forward a little bit here. There's just, you know, I think we could just be talking for four or five hours here. Um, one of the things that I did want to talk with you about is um, is, is what what they're saying, uh, what source is saying about earth changes, um, because that's always been uh, something that, that's brought up 
frequently uh, from my audience on my shows is about earth changes because we still have a very fearful um, energetic that resides with the human species. Um, there's still a lot of a lot of fear on this planet, and uh, uh, of course, you know, I, I do see us transitioning through that. More and more people are getting it, but in the meantime, uh, let us, uh, you know, let us hear from you what they're saying about the Earth changes. Well, I do see that they're going to continue. Um, you know, back in 2010, when I'd be asked these questions. I'd look in and source would show me what was going to happen in certain areas. And um, certainly they did manifest very soon afterwards. But I would recheck six months later and, you know, you look and you see the, that the grids of the earth are fluctuating. They look like they're topsy-turvy, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that they're just all over the place, uh, like, a, like a, a blanket that gets thrown up in the air and when it comes down it's got all these different bumps in it you know mm-hmm. and so and then the last time I looked which was in December um, I saw all this heat underneath the oceans mm-hmm. and I don't know if it's coming from the core of the earth or where it's coming from but heat 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 everywhere okay so heat and pressure and the thing is is the earth's got to release that somehow so source did say you know you are going to see more earthquakes and they're not all going to be you know, devastating earthquakes. I mean, they look like a series of little ones that would be kind of surfacing in fault lines that maybe you wouldn't see any activity, uh, would be common. Well, now all of a sudden some of these fault lines are going to be letting off some steam, okay? Mm-hmm. But it looked like that that has to happen, and, and that has to, the earth has to do something with what's going on underneath. Okay, so it did show that you're going to still have earthquakes, you're going to have uh, eruptions, you're going to have weird storms. And some are natural and some aren't, and that's another conversation. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. <yep. laughs> All right, but I think the point was, the source said, uh, everybody always wants to know where's the safe places to be. Okay? Mm-hmm. And the source basically says, uh, anywhere you are, you know, like if you're, if you're becoming a conscious person, consider yourself a safe place. Okay, but on the other hand, it also told us that we had to remember that not everybody was meant to, you know, go hide out in the mountains or, you know, some people's mission during this time period is to be in the thick of stuff. You know, they're the the workers, the helpers, they're the warriors that are right in the middle of it all, okay? So, but I think when I look at the big picture, I'm not fearful of it at all. I just say, well, it's just, it's just a fact now, everybody that the climate is changing and the planet is changing and it's rumbling and it's grumbling and, you know, sometimes it'll create some disastrous things and sometimes it won't. But the most important thing is is that everybody's most likely where they're meant to be. Okay, and well, I don't know if you've noticed too, but it seemed like last year all of a sudden all kinds of people were moving, you know, big when I lived in Hendersonville, North Carolina, which is about uh, 30 miles south of Asheville, when we were leaving there in October, there were so many people that year who had moved there from all sorts of strange places. And they all said the same thing. I don't know why I'm moving here. I, I just know that I am. Okay? And we came to San Diego, and we said it was to be with my children, but I'm aware that there could be other reasons I'm here. And certainly, of all the places that I would consider safe, you know, California is a bit up in the air. You know, it's a big, huge question mark. Right. Okay, but but I've also seen that a lot of the western states, Oregon and Washington, um, would actually may have some more damaging things than California. I still don't ever see California going into the ocean. Every time I look, I never see that. I see that there's other fault lines around the planet that take the heat off and take the pressure off. But... You know, for me to sit here and say you won't see any more floods, that's not what we can expect. We can expect more of the same. Mm-hmm. And that, that'll happen until this balances out. And, um, you know, when I talked about the forces of evil being done, um, once that starts to dissipate, then we'll see things calm down. 
Yeah, I think, and and I, 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 when you were talking about that earlier, one of the things that I would have commented on is that it's it's reaching its its implosion point. It is, yeah. And uh, you know that's what's been shown to me um, as part of the information in my book that I still haven't got edited and put out yet. Um, and and that's part of the information that was imparted upon me was that it's reaching its its in implosion point, and at some point. Um, when it does, it, it, it's it's as is all things. There's nothing that remains the same, and it's the truth of what we're experiencing now. Soon enough, this reign of evil or terror, whatever you want to call it, uh, mm-hmm. is going to be. Its day is done, and actually, in the way that I look at it, it's already done. What what we're witnessing now is kind of a echo, so to speak, of a past behavior that is a memory and and these people don't know to do it to stop and think about what it is that they're doing although i i will tell you some of those that we might consider of of dark thoughts and dark deeds uh, some of them have become awakened mm-hmm. and um we're, we're going to find a lot of them that are going to turn their back on that and they're going to choose a different path right and that's what's going to help uh, with the with the implosion portion of it, right? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we have a question that came in. Okay. Uh, if humanity develops a good relationship with the fairies, will the fairies help lessen some of the earth changes? That's an interesting question. Well, I think what they would do is really um, teach us how to be more harmonious. So I don't know that they would fix anything for us. I don't think it's like that. I think that they, what they would do is teach us about nature in a way that we don't know. And I think that's how they'll help us. They'll help us by educating us. But I think if they had the power to alter some of this now, they would have done it, you know. <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of like asking God, you know, if I'm a good person, you know, will you save me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I understand that. understand yeah. that. Yeah. But my understanding of that kingdom... Um, is they know things about nature and the way grids work underneath the surface and the way different all sorts of things about different plant life and insects. They know that kingdom, you know, that's their forte. And we we need to cop on and realize that they're living creatures and uh, they can teach us. And that's certainly what Findhorn is all about. It's what Paralandra is about down in, I think she's in Virginia. But there's places where they actually plant, start planting gardens and uh, vegetable and flower based on what the elementals were telling them to do. And they all have wonderful, wonderful crops. So it's, it's a real vital force. And I think, um, you know, when this lady, this Penny Kelly wrote in her book, when you know, the elves first started screaming at her, not really screaming, but saying, what are you doing to the world? <laughs> What are ye all doing with the world? You know? Yeah, I mean, like, you know, you're out to destroy it. Really, they're not happy with us. Yeah, no, I know. And, you know, if we would all just get into a little bit more of a sensitive, uh, energetic space, yes. uh, we would begin to hear more of what our environment, our personal environment is, the land around us is asking for. Absolutely. And yeah. that's that's a wonderful arrival point, I think. It is. And just think most of us aren't even in tune with our bodies, Rebecca. Oh, I know. I know we that. We can't, can't even hear what our own bodies are asking for. It. So there's work to be done there. Oh, there is. There is. <laughs> and, you know, that's something that I, I've also give, I give to people as a little bit of information to teach them how to begin to listen to their body. Once they start opening up to that process, it becomes easier and easier uh, to begin to listen to those subtleties and trust what the body is telling you. Yeah. And it's amazing. I mean, there's times when I've put stuff up to my mouth to, to drink it or eat it, and I'm like, I, my body is like going, no, <laughs> you know. Or I'll go to the grocery store and go, oh, doesn't that look good? You know, my eyes are perceiving that, oh, that looks wonderful. I go to pick it up, my hand is like, are you kidding me? Do not, we do not want that. <laughs> You're like, okay, never mind. <laughs> I guess I'm not eating that this week. <laughs> I never get that reaction about chocolate, though. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I do about some chocolate. Um, oh, I, yeah, I, I know. I do. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah, but I do love chocolate. I do, too. Yeah, I think chocolate's uh, 
Mm, it's a beautiful thing. All right. Uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, there's a couple more things that I'd love for you to cover. Uh, okay. One of them, of course, is the extraterrestrials. And then the other one is numbers in our DNA strands. Okay. All right. Well, ETs, um, they were forgot a lot of the questions people were asking me. But, you know, a lot of us are them, as many of us realize, that we've been coming and going back and forth to this planet for eons. And a lot of us were the original uh, beings that helped seed this planet back in the beginning. I certainly have a memory of coming to this planet uh, in my Merkaba uh, mm. when there wasn't too much here. And yeah. I brought rose seeds, and I felt that I came from the Andromedan system and brought all these rose seeds everywhere. You know, I was sprinkling them all around and planting them. Okay, so, um, you know, I don't really know which aspect of it you want me to talk about because, you know, there has been a dispensation that occurred last year where many of the the positive light beings that were were really not allowed to come in too much before last year um, because we've been given a certain amount of time to use our free will choice, you know, to grow and to learn as souls. But that's all changed. You know, we're, we're actually being given help in a lot of, from a lot of species now. Um, and, of course, there are the negative ones that are running around dressed up like humans. Yes. Uh, that have been infiltrating and uh, causing all sorts of havoc. And I, I even will go so far as to say that I do believe those are behind, those are the beings that are behind a lot of this uh, altering of our food. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like it's it's okay for them in, in where they're at, but it's not okay for us. Okay, so, you know, I still think there's a huge uh, movement here to try to uh, stay controlling the earth because they've colonized earth a long time ago, and uh, don't really want to give up the ghost, you know? Right, exactly. But uh, that's all changing, and they're not going to be vibra- vibrationally compatible with these new energies. So they're, they're either going to have to shift themselves and surrender to uh, being changed as well, you know, because they also, being one of God's creatures, have the just as much of an opportunity to biologically shift as anybody else does, Okay. And not in the same way, of course, but, uh, you know, to evolve to a, another level than what they've been functioning at for eons. So we'll see how that turns out. But certainly, yeah, I mean, it is true. We've, we've been messed with. We've been experimented with and all sorts. Uh, but I just look at it like, uh, you know, well, they look at us just like we look at animals in terms of, you know, Let's go experiment on animals. Let's do testing on animals. Yeah, we're just we're just a, a kind of food source in a sense, and, and and you know I call them the mad scientists. That's yeah. I had a I had a guest on, and I I made, said that term and uh, about the mad scientists, and this person did not agree with my statement. Oh really? And went on to this huge dissertation about scientists and this and that, and I said, well, let me. Let me reframe my statement to you. <laughs> this is what I think the mad scientists are doing. <laughs> yes, and it's pretty much what you just stated. And uh, you know, I, uh, that it's it's a more of a mentality than it is like a group, because they they they're not. It's not relegated to one species or um, race of beings. It's kind of spread out. Like you know, we have wonderful human beings, and we have some that don't act so wonderful. Right. I mean, it's the same thing. It's the, that same principle um, applies as it does to us, as it does to other other species and races, in my opinion. Well, yeah, and specifically, um, you know, Pleiadians, for example, <clears throat> you know, a lot of Pleiadians are scientists. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and yet I've met some Pleiadians that are incarnate here that, you know, are screwing with the DNA, you mm-hmm. know. And then there's others that have produced marvelous, you know, uh, healing solutions to problems. So, like you say, there is a mixed bag probably in just about every species. But, well, I won't say that. I think when you do get into the higher frequencies, the negativity can't survive there. So I don't feel it's present in higher dimensions. You know, I have to agree with that statement as well. I Actually, you're one of the first people that's ever said that, but I have to agree with that. 
Mm-hmm. It's a great now, it's, this is the reason why, uh, I don't know if you noticed it, what, but in December, a lot of my clients and even in the groups I had, people were all questioning and, com- and complaining about this overwhelming sadness. Mm-hmm. They were saying, I just feel this sorrow. I don't know where it's coming from. I, I feel anxious, like something catastrophic, catastrophic is going to happen any minute. So I went into the records and I asked Source about it. And Source said, okay, this is what's going on. It's like, you know, we're coming into this birth canal. So we're being squeezed. So you, you got this light that's coming in that is putting pressure against the cells and anything not compatible with that particular light or anything unhealed coming up. And what Source said to us is we all do a great job of camouflaging grief and uh, anger and all sorts of negative emotions. We, do, we really do a great job of suppressing. So all this was coming out and it was being thrown out into the atmosphere. It was like being released from our bodies out into the collective. And we were all feeling it. And uh, I totally saw it. You know, I thought it's actually part of the cleansing if you think about it. Because as you go tighter and tighter down toward the center of the Milky Way, you know, in that path, it's like going into the tunnel when you die, you know? Right, exactly. You go out towards that light, and as the light comes, you know, everything else unlike itself, you know, leaves. Right, exactly. <laughs> I, think, I think we were watching it come out and leave and be, be thrown out as... Um, emotions and thought form into the environment and then of course what happens then is like attracts like so you get entities that are attracted to it and then you had this whole little period here in fact it made sense of a dream that my husband had you know he dreamt this one night that he was on some astral plane slaying all these snakes and yet in the dream there was another part of him that was down here in 3d doing the dishes (laughs) wow how interesting was that wow but I, once I asked Source and I thought, oh, yeah, that's what he was doing. He was, he was up there slaying entities that were attracted to the stuff being released from us. But you can see how certain people can't handle that pressure of that process. Right. And that's where you see people take their lives and do all kinds of really crazy things, you know? You know, and, and, and it's, that's a very good point. Again, um, you know, we... we been sitting here talking really what you're talking about is energetics you know this is uh the 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 harmonics of frequencies and we uh most people do not recognize that even though we can't feel it or sense it doesn't mean it doesn't um affect us uh we have a lot of invisibility around us uh you know radio waves and sound waves and uh energetic waves magnetic waves it doesn't mean that they if we can't see them, that they don't exist. It means that they do exist, right? We know that they exist. They can measure it. And all of that stuff is floating around all the time. So it's triggering us. I mean, the billions of pieces of information that our body receives and transmits in any moment is just, it's its unbelievable. Right. Unbelievable from a subatomic level. I mean, you know, uh, and, and it goes out into, you know, the, the multiverses, if you will. I mean, it's it's really fascinating, and if people could be a little bit more, uh, I guess, intuitive, I guess, within self, they will begin to uh, adjust to these energetics and realize what is being, uh, what they're feeling in their body uh, is a direct result of something they've ate or done or ingested, whatever, as opposed to maybe something that's an unseen energetic that's... Um, you know, come into their space, and it's it's creating some kind of a trigger mechanism. Right. And uh, so, yeah, very valuable uh, pieces of information there. Um, yeah. All right. So we've got the ETs, and we've got a question about the ETs. So let me let me ask you that question before we move off of that topic. Okay. Um, can you talk about the differences between physical ETs and etheric beings? Okay. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, Aside from the fact that, you know, some have bodies and shape shift, (laughs) you know, we definitely have physical ETs here. Uh, Most of us would, well, I think we have positive and negative, to be honest, that are actually walking around this earth. And, you know, you will see 
some shape shift in front of you. So yeah, that's they're, they're act- yeah they act there. I know somebody it, it actually happened to. Um, but those they're more reptilian. They're more denser. You know, primal is what I like to call them. Mm-hmm. Very primal, hot energy. Okay, but when you get into astral ETs, um, I'm going to talk more about the fact that they move in and out of different dimensions. That there are ETs that have no problem uh, popping in and out. Okay, right. In, in, you know, in different dimensions, so they may not necessarily have the same physical density. But I think what actually happens is somehow they take us to where they are and not the opposite. Okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like I think they have a way of taking us to their particular dimension for a, a temporary moment. Okay? Right. And, and doing what they do and then dropping us back. Okay? okay? Right. That's what it feels like to me. And, of course, they'd all have, you know, there's there's some that actually, some very benevolent ETs that have light bodies uh, when you go to look at them, they don't seem to take on a form at all. And there's others that are a little denser. So I, to answer the listener's question, I have to say that I've seen different forms, quote unquote, you know, on a wide variety of, of levels with all sorts of races and ETs. So I don't know if I'm answering what they really want to know. And if I'm not being clear enough, if they could get a little more specific, that'd be great. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, I think what they're talking about is maybe spiritual form um, um, as opposed to um, physical. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. I think. (laughs) Yes, that's what I mean. But, you know, then I want to, you know, you kind of cross over and you get into entities. Right, you do. You do. Okay. And entities definitely um, exist and they definitely have particular uh, spirit bodies and essences and many of them really can't materialize physically uh, you know they try to use us to do that you know use our yeah. magnetic energy all right yeah but but there are there are lots of entities floating around and you know when i just mentioned you know the like attracts like recently with you know if you think what gets, what gets emitted from somebody the quality of vibration it comes from somebody and whether an entity is attracted to that or can use it if it's really low vibrational, then it's going to attract all sorts of uh, lower spirits. And what I let me just mention this because it it came to mind, and I've noticed it since I've been here with my granddaughter. Is there's this whole uh, thing going on with children, where the toys are zombies, the toys are vampires, the toys are ghouls. You know, there's a whole yes. set of dolls. Remember yes. those Barbie dolls? Yes. Okay, now. The, there's all these monster dolls. Okay? Yes, yes. And, you know, I look at, yeah, and I look at that and I go, what is going on with that? Okay, and, you know, it's zombie, zombie, zombie. Everything's zombies and ghouls. And a part of me is thinking, so what's happening here really, you know, is, is these type of creatures, uh, you know, making a presence now more than ever before, what's happening or is it part of the plan of the negative agenda to be putting that vibrational level into children's imaginations? And I, I, I'm really a bit concerned about it, to be honest. I mean, parents laugh at it, and I think it doesn't mean anything. But if you've ever tuned into true vampire energy, you know, you'll know that, that that's not a joke. No, it's not a joke. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you I've experienced that as an incoming thing. And that's what... You know that that just literally turned turned my life around, and I I got out of my naivety uh, real quick mm-hmm. with the influx of that many many years ago. Uh, grateful that I had the experience, or I wouldn't have known about it. And um, you know, uh, one of the theories, and this is just a theory that I have on, in regards to the zombie thing, and the, you know the ghouls and all of that. Uh, it really started really heavy duty a couple of years ago. Uh, during the quote unquote Halloween time, you know, uh, and they they just keep it up and keep it up and keep it up. They just keep producing these vampiric and zombie like movies. Um, and some people have attributed the zombie thing as to the big pharma uh, by putting people on all of these drugs. Are you depressed? They give you a drug. Are you not sleeping well? They give you a drug. 
Um, you know, and, and it clearly states in there, these, these, these pharmaceutical companies clearly have to make the statement that, you know, this drug that you, that, that this prescription that you take uh, can cause, uh, tuberculosis is a big thing. It can cause cancer, it can cause death, it can be fatal, it can do this, it can do that, it can cause depression and make you suicidal. They give you depression drugs that make you just suicidal. I'm sorry, what's, what's wrong with that picture? I mean, did not <laughs> anybody else get it? You know, I'm like, hello? And people run to their doctors going, I'm depressed, give me that drug. And you're going, I hello? Know. What are you doing? And I think that is, that is part of the movement, so to speak, and that gets into that whole artificial life. Right, so, the, yeah. that syntheticness. Yeah, that zombie life. Yep, that's exactly right because you do not have a brain to think anymore. That's right. Because then, the the artificiality is what props you up. Mm-hmm. And the one thing, let me comment, and I'll springboard off of this, Rebecca, if I could for a minute. Oh, absolutely. About the artificial storms, and I wanted to mention this earlier, but I've been in um, a couple of them, and I'll tell you. There is a way that you can tell if a storm is uh, made by the negative agenda. And the reason is, is it's not just that the force of it is strange. Like we were going through the mountains of West Virginia about a year and a half ago, and we got into this hailstorm. And this hailstorm, not only were the hail balls really huge, but it lasted for 45 minutes. Every, Every single car and truck got off the road, and the clouds had a very strange shape. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it was that it had an emotional component to it where you felt like you were in in hell. I mean, I've never experienced anything like it. I felt like I was in this black hole that was hell and I was never going to get out. It felt so sinister. And I've experienced rainstorms, common rainstorms that feel like that. And that's the difference that I've noticed with artificial storms is they have some sort of pulsing going on in them that's affecting the emotional nature in people. And I'm a little, I'm really concerned about that. When in our discussion about becoming zombies and getting down to those low vibrational levels, I mean, that's, the word I use is sinister. It's sinister. Yeah. Insidious is my favorite word. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad we see eye to eye. Isn't it great to have a guest on that you agree with? <laughs> I do. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Doesn't always happen. Anyway, <laughs> well, you know, and and I I want to I want to just comment real quickly here on on the artificial storms. Um, I used to, and I I was saying this on my show many years ago. I'd say, anybody looked up in the sky? Lately, does it not seem artificial to you? Yeah. And you know, there's a, a was a, there was a huge artificial energetic, so to speak, that was kind of implanted, so to speak, on this planet. Um, I suspect that was when a big rollout came, because after that is when the the real, um, I, I guess, uh, more frequent artificial storms would hit. Like we were sitting there talking about the a few years ago about the tornado that went literally almost from coast to coast, from east to west, or from west to east. That's unheard of. A tornado does right. not, does not, you know, and that's not part of the natural earth changes. You can actually no, feel it. You can feel the snow if it's if it's real or artificial. Like, we haven't had any snow here. I'm, I live in Missouri, Kansas City area. And uh, we don't have any snow here. The weather actually feels artificial. I know what you so there is a, a a definite kind of um, blanket, so to speak. Yes. So that, mm-hmm. Maybe that maybe that's a little heavy of a word, but there's like a blanket, mm-hmm. and in that blanket they go, oh, let's see, you know, it's the mad scientist again. Let's see what we can do. Oh, let's see, let's let's create this over here, and we'll create that over here, and um, you know, we can through meditation, by the way, through energetically meditating, we can break these spells. Um, that that has been placed upon this planet in regards to some of this artificial uh, technology that's being used to control the weather and things such as that. Yes, I agree. Yep. And we all need to begin to do that daily. Mm-hmm. Yes. So before we run out of time, <laughs> believe it or not, this is where we're at. 
I will. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to have you back on. I hope you'll come back on. I truly I do. Will, sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk some more about Akashic Records. We'll take more questions. We couldn't get to all of them tonight, so I do apologize to everyone that we just could not get to all the questions that came in. So we promise to have uh, and Gail back again very soon, uh, maybe next month, and we'll continue discussions on the Akashic Records and some more about a time of change. But please let everyone know about your websites, how to get a hold of the book, and any contact information that you wish to share. Okay, well, if you're in this country, you can get a hold of the book by going to a timeofchange.info. That's all one word, a timeofchange.info. If you're out of the country, you can go to Amazon, and the book actually is on Amazon, whether you're in this country or the next country. But uh, and it's in all the electronic formats. Um, you can get some of them, like the Nooks and all of those, by going to Smashwords. But my website is angelrose.com. That's a i n g e a l r o s e dot com. Angelrose dot com, and you can also email me at angelrose at angelrose dot com. You know, um, I have to say that. Um, you know, I, I, I really wanted to get into the Akashic Records more, and we got into your book, and we didn't even get through all of the book as far as, you know, just as even the general overview of it, and, and didn't even touch uh, 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 as much on the Akashic Records as I wanted. And certainly there's a ton more information um, that, you know, that thing leads into another. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to having you back on again. And I Good. thank you so much for being available tonight for us. <laughs> uh, I really do. This is just. Well, it was fun. Oh, good, good. Well, this has been a joy for us, and I thank you so much for being here. I thank the audience and all your questions.